Welcome back to We Can Walk About in Our Gardens and Ears Virtually. We're coming to you from GardenAtoZ.org. I'm Stephen Nicola. I'm Jan Pekanovich, and we are now talking on our focus on spring startup. Uh, there is a note-taking guide. The first page tells you primarily a, a summary that we'll get to in a minute of, uh, of what we're focusing on. But because we already have a webinar that you can look at on spring startup, what we're looking at right now is what's particular to this year and this this uh, um, set of circumstances we have going out there. So that first page really just takes you through, there are a, 11 steps that we go through at the beginning of the year. And we've been doing this for 40 years and it still works for us. Yep. It's, it is a lifesaver. I stand out there in the spring, no matter how many times I've gone out in the winter and tried to keep up with things, no matter how late I worked into the fall, always in the spring, I am overwhelmed. I stand there going, what, what do I do first? And what we worked out was the first thing you do is prune the woodies. The first thing you do is forget about all the stuff you're looking at on the ground, get your pruning done, get, get that out of, the way. out of the way. Yeah. Then you can cut down the herbaceous debris that's out there. Then you can rake. Then you can spread any fertilizer that you if need. necessary. And then edge the bed, weed the bed. Then you can divide the plants. Then you can make moves. Then you can put mulch on everything and put your pansies and other cool season and field grown things that haven't been brought up in a greenhouse and put them out. Um, those are all written up for you um, in the Weekend Walk about 102. And you can hear about them. You can read about them in that note taking guide. Um, on today's note-taking guide is a link to that older one. So if you want to look, the details are there and you can look at that. But today we're looking at what's going on today, what our priorities are today, because that was a chronological order. That's what we do first, second, third, fourth, fifth. Today we're looking at it topically. We're going to look at the topics that are important this year for one reason or another. Because it takes experience to know when I can say, you know what, maybe I should do that first this year. Yeah, maybe not. Maybe the pruning should wait be and I, I can do this. Right. <laughs> or 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 maybe I'm going to have to skip entirely putting any fertilizer on because of problems with getting what it is that we want to get or it, it, there are things that happen. Um, for instance, in 95, we had a winter that went from, in one week, it went from 70 degrees for a couple of days down to negative 22. There was a whole lot of dieback. It was important that year to get that pruning done and that put a lot of other yeah. things off. Um, 2011, there was damage to new foliage at, that came out early. Um, then the next year, there was an ice storm that was a lot more pruning work that needed to be done. And this year, winter weeds are going to be an issue. Very warm. And what that means is um, changes in temperature in the winter. And this winter counts. It was warm. But those warm days sometimes went from 50 degrees down to 20 degrees. Not and always. That's a big drop. And, uh, and you're going to see some damage on plants that's cambium damage. Do you see the cracks on the bark? This is a viburnum. And if you look closer, you can see that the crack extends upward from that horizontal crack. When you see bark lifting like that, it means that there was damage done to the cambium underneath and it wasn't done this year. The first year that there's cambium damage, it just kills the cambium underneath the bark, especially cambium that's exposed to that mm -hmm. change in temperature. So it got warm in the afternoon and then boom, at sunset, it got really cold and the cambium had filled itself with water and the, the cells exploded, boom, they died. The bark that they made the year that cambium made the year before and the years before that stays intact mm -hmm. for a year or so, but new on um, the dead cambium can't make new bark. So after a couple of years, it cracks it and lifts off. And it, you can't fix that damage right now, but you can say to yourself, why did this get damaged? Because this got damaged earlier. Yeah. And the bark has fallen off. And now there's been a roll of callus wound, wound wood there. But you can look and say, something's been happening all the time to this shrub. Maybe I need to put an evergreen between it and the, the afternoon sun in the wintertime so that it's shading it. Or maybe I need to um, put my cut down ornamental grass there just to shade it. Something to shade a little bit. Um, Japanese maples are the, notorious. Are, yeah, notorious for this. They're thin barked trees. So <laughs> are birches, 
so our beaches. And so the side that faces That's whatever sorry. heats up in the afternoon, sometimes it's the side against the house because the house is reflecting off of the glass. Mm -hmm. But you'll see damage. And what you want to do is catch it right away. Don't wait until it gets this bad because that's been going on for quite some time. So we've written about that, about shading the Japanese maple trunk and how you might do that. Um, so you got to, these are trees that lived underneath other trees. That's what a Japanese maple is supposed to be living and the in warm, conditions. And the warmth out of the ground, even off of bare branches, is always re-radiating down and keeping them protected. But if you put them out in the open, it's that afternoon sun that tends to warm up that side, get it working, and then kill it when it turns cold. Um, so we've done things like used an Alaska fall cypress. There's a Japanese maple underneath that Alaska fall cypress, and we're protecting the trunk. We've used hemlock. We've used grass. Just to shade it. Just something to shade it. Even burlap wrapped on the trunk yep. works. So we've used grass. There's our rosemary. Sonia coming back in. Sonia says, I can't keep a rosemary. I said, maybe your house is cold enough. You should be able to keep a rosemary. Um, at any rate, we've written about this before, and there's probably going to be some of that this year. And what it will do is it will kill, it, the, the plant will start dying back later in the summer when you find out that, the, that it can't support the, the, the water transport once it gets hot. This is what happened in 2015 when the ewes leafed out early, and then they did this. And what happened to those, see all the little little bubbles there? That's where a nice uh, full of water, new leaf that was just coming out exploded in the cold. And the same thing happens to the cambium underneath the bark on some of those plants. And there's, there's no saving that, that leaf. It's going to look ugly and then eventually fall off. Fall off. Yeah. And then of course there's the animals, rabbits or voles. I think probably voles on this one. They're such clean cuts. They took uh, Nancy's, Nancy's uh, witch hazel down to just nothing on both sides. They pretty much ate, they didn't eat the bark. People say they ate the bark. They really peeled the bark off in order to get the cambium yeah. underneath and yeah. they, they peeled the cambium and that's the damage. So even though this has buds, she says it had buds, will it be all right? You can see the buds that it set last year all along the branches and they are still alive, but they're going to take water up through the wood in the uh, springtime, so they'll, they'll the the wood, the interior wood, the xylem, will still conduct water up to the leaves. The leaves will leaf out. They will immediately begin photosynthesizing and send starches back to the roots in return. But the starches won't get there because the starches have to go through the cambium, and there's no cambium connecting them to the roots. So these are we've seen occasionally a plant will survive something like this but most likely or not it's going to struggle for a year or two and then just yeah head on. yeah we have told people about putting wax and wrapping them if there's some cambium connection still there but this one looks like pretty much all the way around there's yeah. no connection so there's um, uh, some people have asked well will it be all right well it might it might very well if there's enough starch in the roots it might sprout from the um, the base of the trunk from where the where there is still cambium. Mm -hmm. But in the case of this witch hazel and most of our um, really fine sh shrubs and trees, that's going to be a different plant. There was a graft yes. made. Oh, sorry, Stephen. The graft is the graft is up here on this one. I can see a, a yeah. line. Um, so above that point, you get the nice plant that you bought with a variety name like Cinderella <laughs> crab apple or or Jelena witch hazel. Below that, you get the rootstock, which is just a fast-growing, probably disease-resistant, hardy rootstock. Um, we've written, if you go to Garden A to Z, um, any page on Garden A to Z, and go into the search field in the upper right, um, if you put in winter damage, you're going to get a number of articles that come up that tell you deciduous shrubs and what happens to the inside of the buds it's, and, and, and explains that cambium damage. Um, includes damage to our perennials like mm -hmm. butterfly bush and lavender and, and those kinds of plants. Um, some years we have the problem of it, it's very difficult to work in a garden when there's a machine like that set up in it. Uh, but it's important that they get the pruning done. We were supposed to have pruning done on Thursday this week and the, uh, the company postponed it until next week. And I'm hoping next week that they really can get out here mm -hmm. and fit us in 
because I want that pruning done and out of the way, but it changes your priorities. I'll have to work on something different than what I was going to work on in that bed while those guys are there dropping branches from 60 feet up. Winter weeding this year is going to be good. <laughs> uh, a, a chore. That's uh, one of the cresses. I think it's hairy bitter crest that I'm holding in the with left hand there. Next to it is a chickweed. And those are both winter weeds. Sometimes there's just a couple of them and I can I can pull them out. Sometimes there's a mat of them. And this might be one of those years where you go out to the vegetable garden and find that your whole vegetable garden is, is a mat. Is a sod of those things. In which case, if you get out there early enough, you can put newspaper on top of them. You don't even have to put mulch to yeah. hold it down with I put branches newspaper with heavy branches on it to smother that big area rather than deal with it. But deal with it while it's cool. So I'm, uh, even though I probably should be out working on that thistle and bindweed area, I'm probably going to be patrolling for all of the winter weeds first because they're the ones that are going to grow yeah, and bloom. Um, so these are cresses. There are a lot of mustard family plants that come up real early. Tall rocket. Is, I can't believe this. Tall rocket. There's a, a winter cress. There's a, I forgot what that one is Dead called. Line. Yeah. Um, Isn't that a dandelion? No, yeah. no. That's no. something else. Yeah. Uh -huh. But if they bloom and set seed, we're in trouble. This is a dead nettle, which looks like lamium. And it is a lamium, but it's a weed lamium. And it's been growing out there. I was pulling it in December. Um, but once it goes to, to seed, then they're everywhere. This is a chickweed. It's a couple of them, and you can see that the chickweed is blooming right now. Yeah. Little white flowers all over the place. There are a couple of kinds of chickweed. There's mouse ear chickweed and, and uh, common chickweed, but they're both winter weeds, and we need to get them out. So every year, there's conditions that cause us to focus on particular chores, and sometimes they're climate things, like those things of having the trees pruned and the winter weeds. Sometimes it's regulations. I, I still remember 1993 when yard waste disposal laws changed in Michigan. We could no longer put yard waste out with regular um, household waste. They had to be in separate bags. It was a separate pickup. They went to composting sites instead of the landfills, which was a good thing to do because our landfills were, they tell me, 20% of what was in landfills, maybe it was more than 20% yeah. was all organic material. And we don't want to put that in the landfill. We want to break it down. But I remember the yard, the uh, the um, the trash um, removal people were picking up bags and actually looking inside. I started then labeling bags that had poison ivy in them. I started labeling them with a skull and so crossbones so that they their... wouldn't open them up to see if there was uh, something legal in there or illegal. Um, we had to buy uh, paper bags. Yeah. Um, our neighbors started throwing things into the plastic bags and trying to hide them because they didn't want to spend the money on paper yeah. bags. I found out the paper bags are too tall for a short person to, to open up yeah. successfully by themselves. I mean, it, it, it costs extra time. Um, sometimes you get things like weed ordinance violations. We had something of a weed ordinance violation at the Ortonville um, Native Plant Garden. Lois and Vera here are expressing our delight at having to dig up the whole oh, garden, garden and sort it out and change it because um, although well, it was- took care of it. Well, they were taking care of it, but this, the city, the, the board council decided that it looked too weedy. And so we had to rearrange this wild garden into a garden garden. And uh, doing that in March is not one of the things you want to do, but that's what we had to do. Forget our own gardens, forget weeding, forget edging, get out there and dig up the, the garden. And we've had a weed ordinance violation in our own yeah. yard and know what that's like to do that. We do. There's also a flood. I mean, locally, you can have things and it was a wet winter. We had a lot of water down, which is still sitting. Uh, and the drains in Pat and Carol's yards uh, there's a drain, but it's been overwhelmed by all this water. Mark. You can tell that ewes do not like wet soil at all. Ewes like good drainage only when those are a little bit higher and away from the drain or they're doing well. In our own yard, when we started flooding 2001, we had our first flood, or 2000, one or the other. We flooded seven times in 17 years and the whole house flooded. I dropped everything and started digging a, a sunken garden and a berm to divert to to the water. The water would come from up that hill. way. Yeah. We sat in a sat in a lake yeah. and that took a lot of time. And drainage is important, whether it's a big flood kind of thing or other things. We're going to do that. So I put the we went uh, made a path that went down into that sunken garden. 
And then we had a, then we had a drain come out of there, go all the way out to the road. Yeah, and take the water out of there. Didn't work though. It didn't, it didn't work. work. It still was overwhelmed. It's a lot of water. Too much water. 